forgot about the time, and then before you know it, oh my God, it's five o'clock. It's fine. Right. It's great. I love KFC. <laughs> Excuse me, I'll be right back. His finger looking good. Mm. Hey, what's up, guys? Welcome back to Binging with Babish, where this week I'm very excited to announce that the official Binging with Babish cookbook, the first 100 recipes from the show, is available for pre-order now. Head over to bingingwithbabish.com slash cookbook, where if you pre-order before the October 22nd release date, you get access to special content. More on that later, because it seems as though I have 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9, 10, 11 herbs and spices before me, so we must be taking a crack at the kernel, although I will contend that there must be a 12th herb and or spice, that being MSG, because it's listed on their ingredients list, which is not a dig against KFC. MSG is delicious and totally safe. So with that in mind, let us construct our chicken breading. We're starting with two-thirds of a teaspoon of salt, half a teaspoon of thyme, half a teaspoon of basil, third of a teaspoon of oregano, teaspoon of celery salt, teaspoon of black pepper, teaspoon of dried mustard, four teaspoons of paprika, two teaspoons of garlic salt, one teaspoon of ground ginger, and three teaspoons of white pepper. And of course, Sanders' little secret, three quarters of a teaspoon of MSG. Tiny whisk together, into two cups of all-purpose flour. Next up, we've got to tackle the marinade, or at least what KFC calls the marinade, an undisclosed mixture of water, salt, and a lot of MSG, which is brought to a boil and into which the chicken is dunked before it is breaded. Speaking of which, here's the man of the hour, the chicken. An eight-piece bucket is essentially a whole chicken broken down, so that's exactly what we're gonna do. I've covered this in previous episodes. If you wanna see how to break down a chicken, click the link in the upper right-hand corner right now. Once you're all done, you should have eight pieces, plus a spine and wings, which we're gonna hang on to for later. KFC fries its chicken in a proprietary blend of oils, so I'm just going to use my two favorites, canola and peanut. And so now it's time to start dunking our chicken in various substances. First into the quote-unquote marinade for seven seconds, taking out, shaking seven times, bringing it on over to the breading, dumping it in without caution or foresight, and making sure that each piece is evenly and profoundly coated in the dredge. At this point, KFC shakes the chicken seven times to remove excess flour, but I'm just going to sort of shake it off a little bit and dump it into some 375 degree Fahrenheit oil, where we are going to allow it to fry relatively undisturbed, but flipping after about six minutes, frying for a total of about 10 minutes until the exterior is deeply golden brown and crisp. So we've got our first drumsticks out. Let's see how it compares to some actual KFC, the KFC being on the left. Upon inspecting their ingredients list once again, I saw that they used powdered dried egg whites, which gives them a cragglier, better developed crust. But the flavors are pretty spot on, so we're going to supplement with an egg and buttermilk wash. This time straight out from the quote unquote marinade into the flour dredge, then into the buttermilk and egg mixture, and back into the flour dredge, effectively making something that more resembles extra crispy chicken rather than original recipe. So I might not have hit the mark spot on, but I'm pretty happy with the way that this crust is looking. But let's see how it tastes, and it tastes awesome. For super quick and easy fried chicken, this is not a bad way to do it, but it's lacking a lot of the flavors that I look for in my fried chicken, most notably by way of salt and buttermilk. Also, these buckets of fried chicken look absolutely ridiculous without outside, so let's make some biscuits the way that I imagine KFC makes them, which is frozen ones. The ingredients list on these Pillsbury Grands is almost identical to that of KFC's. Likewise, I'm sure powdered mashed potatoes and powdered gravy are going to do just fine, but we're going to upgrade our gravy the same way the kernel does, by adding what's called crackle, or as I call it, brown sloppy gold. The residue that builds up on the bottom of the pot after deep frying adds a tremendous depth of flavor to gravy, and I just simply cannot recommend it enough. So now that we've got our chicken fried, our potatoes re constituted, our gravy upgraded, and our biscuits out the oven. Finally, we have a facsimile of what was being consumed on screen. Let's just get our chicken center stage here, and if you ask me, it looks the part, and it tastes the part. I really enjoy KFC. I think it is a fast food masterclass. But obviously, everything here has room for improvement. Biscuits made with butter, mashed potatoes made by mashing potatoes, and the chicken, which could dearly benefit from an overnight bath in buttermilk. So please excuse my casual attire while I break down another chicken into eight pieces, because it's late at night and I'm getting them ready for their bedtime brine. Into a large food safe bucket goes 16 ounces of buttermilk along with the aforementioned 12 herbs and spices, along with an extra tablespoon of kosher salt, tiny whisk together, and followed shortly by our chicken pieces, which we want to really press down in there, give them a good mix, and make sure that they're evenly coated in the buttermilk brine. Then this guy is headed into the fridge for at least 6 hours and up to 24, taking it out once or twice during its marinade time to give it a good jostling. Then while the chicken marinates, we're going to make some optional stock. In a large sauce, 
saucepan, I'm deeply browning our chicken wings and spine pieces in a little bit of vegetable oil over high heat, adding some stuff like a whole onion cut in half, a handful of carrots, a handful of celery, a bunch of fresh thyme, and a halved head of garlic. Once the chicken has some nice brown color on it, we're going to deglaze the pot with eight cups of cold water, bring the whole thing to a simmer, lower the heat until it reaches a bare simmer, and keep it there for about four hours until we have a deeply flavored golden chicken stock, which is going to be just perfect for making some gravy. In a smaller saucepan, we are melting six tablespoons of butter until foaming, adding one third of one cup of all-purpose flour, whisking and cooking for an additional minute before slowly streaming in our chicken stock, whisking constantly to prevent clumping and adding about three cups worth, along with a good glug of soy sauce for both flavor and color. Then we're going to bring that to a bare simmer for three to four minutes until it gets nice and thick and gravy-like. As always, taste for seasoning, and then we're going to cover it up and set it aside, taking care not to touch the hot, hot handles, because we got other stuff to make, chief among which are the mashed potatoes. Four pounds of russets get peeled, chopped into one-inch cubes, and placed into a pot of cold water. We're then bringing this pot over to the stovetop, where, as you might have guessed, we are bringing the whole affair to a boil. Once a boil is reached, we are cooking for 12 to 16 minutes until the potatoes are cooked through. We are then draining, reserving the empty pot, rinsing the potatoes with hot tap water, and then commencing ricing. That is, placing a few chunks of potato in a potato ricer and pressing through, creating this nice potato spaghetti effect. Then to our potato spaghetti, we are adding one stick of unsalted butter at room temperature, cut into one inch pieces, and two cups of warm milk, and some kosher salt, and I'm going with white pepper to maintain the color of the potatoes. We're using a lot of milk here, but KFC's mashed potatoes are pretty thin, so I want to recreate that consistency. As always, taste for seasoning, and set aside because we're moving on to my favorite part of the day, buttermilk biscuits. Thanks to a recipe courtesy of America's Test Kitchen, we are weighing out 13 and one half ounces of all-purpose flour, two tablespoons of sugar, four teaspoons of baking powder, a half teaspoon of baking soda, and one and a half teaspoons of kosher salt. This is getting tiny whisked together until homogenous. And then we begin the slightly labor-intensive but totally worth it act of grating two sticks of frozen butter, using the slightly larger holes on a cheese grater. Unlike chopping up the butter in, say, a food processor, this makes nice, thin, long strands of butter that are going to be perfect for layering. We're just going to add the butter to the flour mixture, give it a good mix around, make sure that all the pieces are coated, carefully measure out one one quarter cups of buttermilk, add it to the mixture, and give it a good stir in. Nothing too crazy, it's not going to come together into a ball, we just want to hydrate as much of the flour as possible before turning it out onto a generously floured worktop, where we are going to continue to try to coax it together into a sort of rectangle, which using a generously floured rolling pin, we're going to roll out to the best of our ability. Every instinct is going to tell you that this dough is too dry, but don't add liquid of any kind. Just roll it out to about a 16 by 9 inch rectangle and fold in thirds like a letter, preferably with a bench scraper like this one, which helps a lot in the shaping process. Rolling it out once again into a 16 by 9 rectangle and folding in thirds, repeating the process five times, effectively making something closer to a quick puff pastry than a biscuit dough. But as you can imagine, all those little shreds of butter are getting thinned and flattened and layered. And as you can see, our dough is starting to become more and more cohesive. Once we have completed five rolls, folds, and turns, we are placing the dough on a parchment lined baking sheet, covering in plastic wrap and refrigerating for 30 minutes to firm up. Once thoroughly chilled, we are turning out onto a refloured work surface, rolling out to a roughly 9 by 9 square ish shape, and then using a very sharp knife that we have dusted in flour, we're going to start trimming off the edges. Make sure you make nice, clean, downward cuts, no wiggling, no sawing motions, no back and forth, all of which is going to inhibit your biscuits' rise. And then once we've got the edges trimmed off, we're cutting cleanly into nine square biscuits. Then we're placing back on the parchment lined baking sheet and brushing with butter. By now, you're probably asking, what's up with the square biscuits? Well, cutting these into squares reduces trimming, and trimming never really rises quite the same when you've re rolled it out. Anyway, these guys are going into a 400 degree Fahrenheit oven for 20 to 25 minutes until they are gorgeous. They must be cooled on a wire rack for about 10 minutes before consumption, but you're going to have a hard time waiting because look at those layers. These make Pillsbury Grands look like Pillsbury Casio keyboard, as in grand piano versus... Anyway, finally we're back on chicken and we're making a dredge the exact same way we made with the first batch because I like the way it looked, I like the way it tasted, I like the way it behaved. But to help make it extra crispy, we're adding about half a cup of cornstarch, tiny whisking together and retrieving the chicken from the fridge where it lies in wait. J. Kenji Lopez Alt has a great trick where he adds a few tablespoons of the marinade to the dredge, mixing it up with your fingers or a fork, creating tiny little bits of breading that are going to stick to your chicken 
and make it even more crispier. Likewise, Sean Brock has a trick where he breads all of his chicken at once, hence why I'm using a nice wide casserole here. This basically just helps hydrate even more of the dredge so you get more craggles and crunch in your final product. Once everybody's in their floury bed, we're gonna let them get to know each other for about 10 minutes. Then we're gonna walk back on camera, notice some schmutz on our apron here, that's no good. Then we're gonna walk back on camera and retrieve our chicken, which is ready for frying at long last. Into the same blend of oils it goes at 400 degrees Fahrenheit this time, frying for six to nine minutes until golden brown and crisp, placing on a wire rack and keeping in a low oven. Until all the chicken is finished frying, the dark meat registers 175 and the white meat registers 165. Then once everybody's good and fried, we are scooping up the brown sloppy gold off the bottom of the pot and adding it to our gravy. And now finally it's time to present the perfect meal for both July 4th and the return of Stranger Things. Buttermilk fried chicken, creamy mashed potatoes, homemade gravy, and flaky buttermilk biscuits. I also like to hit the chicken with a little final sprinkle of kosher salt before fixing myself a plate. Let me go ahead and answer your most burning question and tell you that I am a drumstick guy, but I would gleefully eat any piece of chicken on this table. It is juicy, it is crunchy, it is flavorful, it's the best fried chicken I've ever made, and I will be back for seconds. Hey folks, so as I mentioned earlier, my new cookbook, Binging with Babish, the companion cookbook, is available for pre-order now. It is getting released on October 22nd and features the first 100 recipes from my show, beautiful photography, funny stories, and inside glimpses into my weird and wild world of food recreation. And if you pre-order the book, you will get access to special blooper photos, sneak peeks, and an exclusive recipe. Head on over to bingingwithbabish.com cookbook now to pre-order your copy today.